I think there is a lot of utility in that utopian type thinking, even if it is unachievable. You know, this is one of Plato's favorite thought experiments to do is to meditate upon the ideal of a thing, you know, meditate upon the ideal school, meditate upon the ideal society. And even if you cannot achieve that ideal in doing so, you are finding holes in the current system and you can start to plug those holes. Greetings, future fossils. I'm going to keep this brief. Michael Phillip is somebody I can't believe I haven't met in person. Absolutely interesting dude. Excellent podcast host. His show Third Eye Drops I've been on numerous, numerous times. And there's a good deal of cross ventilation going on between his program and my own. He's been on Future Fossils a bunch to discuss Westworld, blockchain, Alistair Crowley's role in winning World War II with Doug Rushkoff. But I'm really glad that I get to share this episode with you today. It's uh, something we recorded in April of 2019, which is just atrocious. It makes uh, this show its own sort of archaeological exercise when it takes so freaking long to get an episode out. But I'm glad we waited because I feel that this week is the week for this conversation. And as soon as you uh, hear what Michael has to say, I think you will agree. This is a, a, a discussion about signing on, subscribing to, or rather being enlisted by the project of cosmic evolution, personal improvement for the sake of the improvement of the entire cosmos, the universe. And, um, you know, the sense that we are tilted towards something, that we're headed there, that, you know, even if we never get there, that we're moving in a direction, you know, towards increasing wholeness, goodness, virtue. I can't help but play the devil's advocate in this conversation, but it ends up being a really vital and fresh and uh, illuminating discourse, I think, the two of us, on some of the deepest philosophical issues available. And I think it's a really excellent introduction to uh, Michael Phillip, if you aren't familiar with his thinking. You know, he's sort of a, uh, like a prism through which you can appreciate all of the great strands of thought that we have inherited. So I'm happy to share this with you. Before we get started, thank you so much to everyone on Patreon who has been supporting the show, helping me keep future fossils independent, ad-free, free to be as weird and freaky and wonderful and bizarre as this show is, and uh, you know, not have to trim the edges in order to accommodate any monopoly men, you know. So new supporters, Karen Morano, Luke Rogers. Stephen Hershey, and pledge-boosting Sophia Minson, as well as everyone else that is supporting the show on Patreon. Thank you so, so, so much for doing that. Thanks to everybody who has been reviewing the show on Apple Podcasts. Yes, it makes a huge difference, and it, it's a, a sheer delight every time I find out that somebody has joined the Future Fossils Facebook discussion group because they caught wind of this show from a review it's just awesome that this conversation continues to to grow and and to bring people into its folds. I mean, that's kind of gross, but you know, I'm I'm into uh, bio horror right now. Which, by the way, the Future Fossils Book Club is uh, rebooting in 2020 with a conversation about Jeff Vandermeer's novel Born, which I am reading now and which I am completely captivated and disgusted and in love with and amazed by. And it's just an incredible work. It's very distinct and freaky and uh, seems just a perfect time to be talking about this totally bizarre sort of post-apocalyptic biotechnological science fiction, exploring identity, personhood, and all sorts of weird shit. So, if you're interested in that, then uh, trip on over to patreon.com slash 
Michael Garfield and uh, join in, you know, chip a couple bucks a month in and get in on our video calls for the Future Fossils book club. I think we'll probably do Dead Astronauts, the the sort of side quill uh, continued world building exercise that comes after Born. Um, and, and we'll just keep going and we will continue to explore the most bizarre and illustrious and mind expanding terrains that we possibly can. And that is my commitment to you. And that is for sure what is going on in this conversation, which is almost a kind of a Jack Parsons rocket ride into the Empyrean. Anyway, enjoy. And, uh, if you have any thoughts, feedback, questions, or, you know, you want to send me hate mail or whatever, <laughs> future fossils podcast at gmail.com. Thanks. And, uh, yeah, give it up for Michael Phillip. Well, dude, Michael, it's a pleasure to have you back on Future Fossils. I know that we, uh, you've been on the show twice before, but both of them were themed episodes where we were talking about <laughs> Westworld and then blockchain, respectively. So I don't feel like either of them was really a, uh, you know, a, a, a proper invite into the the sequence of, or in, into the time capsule. You know, where we get to to really get to know you as a person and discuss some of the ideas that you're. Uh, very, you know, fluent with in, in your own conversations on your show. So mm-hmm. glad we can make the space for it. Mm-hmm. And Rushkoff too. So is, oh, that right. a third, is that a third occasion? Yeah, it is. Okay. So this is number four, actually. I forgot you were a part of that. Car- that was a good one. So yeah, I will, good. I'll link everybody in the show notes to your numerous appearances on future fossils, but I think uh, we have an opportunity to take this one into some, some space where, you know, you, you're not, um, just commenting on someone else's work, (laughs) but on your own experience and so on. So I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, me too, man. I feel like it is a good time for it because even though I've been doing third eye drops for quite a while now, and I've been sort of wriggling my creative probiscus in the technosphere (laughs) for a while, I sort of feel like I am emerging in a little bit more of a unique way right now because I've been writing a ton, both articles and for uh, a potential book. And I was just talking to Corey Allen about this. And as you know as well, because you've, you've written so many articles, I don't think there is any medium as effective as writing for forcing you to actually say something unique because podcasts are so tangential. They allow you to kind of interface with an idea and then just take a left turn when you're done with it. But with writing, if you're doing it in any kind of responsible way where you're fleshing out ideas, <laughs> you've you've got to say something and you've got to say something in a way that is coherent and logically laid out so that it makes sense to the reader. And it doesn't give you those convenient outs in a way that something like a podcast does as much as I I love podcasting. So I do feel like I'm starting to fold the steel of my own philosophy in a much more direct way than I have in the past. That's a very uh, Daniele Bellelli kind of metaphor there. I like that. Ooh, yeah. I'll to take fold it. the steel Wonderful. of your ideas. Yeah, I remember a couple of years ago, uh, oh, many years ago, actually, Daniel Pinchbeck was trying to get me to write a book for Evolver Editions, which I got to about a decade too late. But um, yeah, he was saying, you know, it's it's not even so much about the finished product as it is about the challenge of crystallizing your own ideas. Mm-hmm. You know, it's giving yourself that sort of formal structure and, uh, you know, a disciplined engagement with your own mind. And so, yeah, even though I find this format very useful for 
the sort of flash of inspiration and the the sandbox where you can kind of play with you know within a conversation about what it might be that you're thinking about you know then the hardest part for me it is and always has been moving from the the playscape of conversation into this sort of rigorous and very very personal very private mm-hmm. engagement that comes through writing. So, so let's talk about, uh, let's, let's get into the, the structure. Cause this all start, starts with you hitting me up a couple days ago to tell me about this powerful experience you had and, and the implications that it's had for you. Yeah. Yeah. So that occurrence in particular, it, it had been sort of a while since I had a, a, a psychedelic experience. And, you know, despite the fact that I'm generally always directly or indirectly championing them on my podcast or i just like hosted a a panel at witma uh in la on the topic of psychedelics so despite that it had been a while since i had a personal experience and i feel like i got one of the clearest messages that i've ever gotten in in the throes of the psychedelic fireworks i mean there it's sort of mm-hmm. one of those things that you I, I think everybody who has done um at least a handful of psychedelic experiences <laughs> has had, a handful of- <laughs> yeah 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 a handful in a single occasion or a handful meaning multiple occasions but you know it's it's the underlying message of essentially life and nature. But I, I feel like for me that that came more in sort of fractured flashes previously. And this time it came as a sort of well-formed overarching idea in a way that was very powerful and that I could not pull away from throughout the entire trip. And I left trying to wrap that in nomenclature to I think a moderate degree of success. And the nomenclature I wrapped around it is the phrase, the cosmic yes. And I sent you that incredible Manly P. Hall quote that I feel like perfectly encapsulated the cosmic yes. And I don't have that in front of me right now. Ooh, let me find it. Let me find it because it was, I've still got your text thread pulled up here. Let's see, Manuel, Manly P. Hall. For for those who don't know, uh, why don't you why don't you frame that? Because this guy's kind of a legendary figure in esoteric lore. Yeah, so I think he's probably most well known for his Secret Teachings of All Ages book, which it always blows my mind, man. It's funny because we're, we're sitting here in our in our thirties talking about trying to slog through writing a book. He wrote a book called. The Secret Teachings of All Ages, which deserves to be called that when he was like 25 or what? something. It's like, yeah. Oh my yeah. God, I did not realize I know. it was that young. I know, man. I know. And when you read it, it sounds like, you know, a wise old professor or something. And yeah, so so he's he's always blown my mind for that reason. You know, he was a, you know, a well-known kind of Masonic scholar of everything philosophical and esoteric. But He's got all these lectures online on Spotify and in uh, various locations. And I just happened, I don't even know why I chose this one. I think I listened to two of them, but um, I'll see if it's in my my recent listens. You may need to put the Jeopardy music on or something. Well, oh, I can read I the quote them. while you're looking. Yeah. Yeah. So just so if people want to listen to this, to this lecture, but in the meantime, yeah. Yeah, please. Okay, so this is this is what um, it reminds me of uh, when in Darwin's Pharmacy when Richard Doyle says that the Arrowhead Trip Report archives are page after page of graphomaniacal claims to ineffability. That there's some, <laughs> <laughs> that you know that the so much is written about these non ordinary experiences and the sort of revelatory contents precisely because they are so difficult to put in words. But so at any Mm -hmm. rate, here we go. Mm -hmm. In a sense, so imagine getting a text message uh, that sounds like this, folks. (laughs) In a sense, we are all gods in the making. When we become gods in reality, we will be the most humble of all creatures. 
We will not be proud that we rule. We will be sad that we cannot rule better. Little by little, life is coming to every atom of space. Every molecule must grow up. Every grain of sand must become a star. We are the carpentry. We are the working crew that brings this about. We are already transmuting all kinds of forces within our own bodies. Our own alchemy is at work. Our understanding of astronomy is broadening out to understand a universe of value rather than a universe of forms. Everywhere we are growing, and growth begins with sincerity. As long as there are mistakes in our own thinking, we are going to suffer. But if we correct these mistakes, we will then become disciplined servants of the largest and most noble of all forces, the regeneration of universal life, the fulfillment of an infinite plan that is beyond our comprehension. Yeah. And, and I stand by that that is a perfect, perfect encapsulation of what I experienced and, and the, the sort of message that I was struggling to define in that trip, because it has everything is there. Everything is there from the sort of overarching cosmic mission, like the sort of great work, you know, that uh, occultists and masons always talk about the sort of great work of of a kind of temple building or, you know, multi-generational project. I mean, that's that is the overarching project of projects, right? I mean, that is sort of the logical conclusion of everything that we're doing as sentient beings, this forever unfolding of information and ideas and light and warmth and whatever. I mean, that is the logical conclusion of that, right? And it goes further than that. I mean, it, it comes down to an individual level because he talks about, uh, and this is something else that I've I've heard men mentioned in various uh, esoteric and contemplative traditions, is the idea of correction. You know, the idea of correcting your mind, the idea of controlling your mind, the idea of living virtuously, that's key, right? Because it's not just on an individual level that we need to do that, though we do. We need to each pixel by human pixel correct ourselves so that we can all collectively move forward into this cosmic yes or this process of forever, forever cosmic unfolding so there's really everything there from the personal and the micro to the unbelievably macro. And uh, I think the only other thing that I would add on top of it is I think that that's what nature wants. And I think that if I were going to go out on a limb and say that the human species has a purpose, it is this and that we've been lifted to this level to accomplish this purpose. And in a way, by not accomplishing this purpose, we're actually sort of perverting our own nature and we're damaging the very thing that elevated us. So that's what I've been thinking about. And I think, man, I feel like we could have an entire podcast, like line by line going through that quote. Oh, yeah. and I did, I did, I did find the, uh, I did find the lecture and it is on Spotify. It is called, if you just look up Manly P. Hall, there's something called the Wisdom Series and it's the Challenge of Forever Becoming Part One. Ooh, okay, so <laughs> in in let's start there, right? In the, the Challenge of Forever Becoming, it reminds me of... Uh, the songwriter Stuart Davis, who's who's somebody I've I've known and, and looked up to for years, who likes to embed st the stuff from his his long running Zen Buddhist practice and his sort of integral philosophical uh, practice into his writing. Um, but he does it in a really sort of all embracing way. He's very familiar with his shadow. He wrote this great song. Uh, where he said, you wouldn't know love if it sprouted horns and spat shit in your face, uh, <laughs> it, which is a song. I think it's, it's it's the song is Wizard and it's about sort of like this, uh, you know, just a, a total reclamation of everything that is taboo. And he's he really is um, playful with his own sort of unpleasant parts, as it were. But Stuart has this this other thing uh, where you know, he has this extraordinary compassion and sensitivity to the human condition. And I don't remember the name of the song, but I remember he wrote a song about how 
he thinks really we're not afraid to die. We're afraid of living forever. And mm-hmm. that, that this is the, the challenge in the, the Buddhist, uh, the Bodhisattva's vow, you know, this vow to continue reincarnating and forestall your, your sort of blissful reunion with the void uh, until all sentient beings have been awakened. And so, you know, he's like, the scary thing is thinking that you're basically signed on to continue to suffer in a body that lives and dies over and over and over forever, you know, or like when um, Eric Godsey was on the show, uh, he was talking about how even in, you know, when he was a kid growing up in a, in the Christian faith, that he had a hard time understanding how an eternity of heavenly bliss was anything other than just horror, you know, that like, mm. even at the, like the afterlife of, so you just are happy forever, like, and, and nothing, there's no like spectrum <laughs> of, of experience, you know, this, this sort of fixity. So there's something in that Manly P. Hall quote, which I would love to hear you anchor in your own experience about the challenge of participating in a, in this kind of universal project. Like how is it that you found that particular piece of it resonant to you? And, and how do you understand the sort of evolution of a God self or whatever in, in light of that? Yeah, I think it's just the most noble thing to aspire to. You know, it's we can't hope to ever touch that as an individual. But as I said before, I do think pixel by pixel, we can contribute to that process. And that's really all that we can do is transmute ourselves into beings of progress from beings of consumption. Of course, you know, consumption comes you know, part and parcel with being a human. But I also think that if our life is about the right things, that consumption can sort of be nullified. That sort of karmic toll that it takes just to be a being can be maybe not nullified, maybe nullified isn't isn't uh, the right word. <laughs> Because the the damage is the damage, I suppose. You know, the the carbon emissions that we emit just by living are going to be there. But I think that you know, it's kind of like the classic. Look at how how fucked up everything is. But maybe the ends justify the means because we got the internet out of it. But I I don't think it's it's that it's quite that tectonically awful. But I think that. From an individual standpoint, if you anchor your psychology in that overarching notion that this is the ideal that we're all after, because, you know, we're, we're, we're always arguing, right? Human beings have always been arguing about the, the, the larger point of it all. But I don't understand how anybody could argue against this notion that we want to spread life. We want to spread well-being. We want to spread light and warmth throughout our world and hopefully off of our world and continue this process of forever becoming or forever unfolding of forever evolving. Because if we don't, what is there? It's like, it's, and that, this is why I, I called it the cosmic yes, because it's either saying yes to life or it's saying no to life. Really, it's 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 as simple as that dichotomy because you might as well just go the nihilist route, right? If you're not if you don't think there's a point to life, if you don't think there's a point to continuing to spread knowledge and gain knowledge and live better, live more justly, live more virtuously, live with more information, then there is no point. And that's clearly to me what life wants to do and left to its own devices. That is what life does up to a certain standpoint, right? It continues to grow and create new organisms. Like, you know, just just look at the evolution of the planet, you know, going from, you know, hundreds of millions of years ago to the mycelial spread to the Cambrian explosion to the, you know, the emergence of mammals and eventually humans. This is a natural unfolding process that seems to be at least trying everywhere we've looked. We we find the 
fossils on Mars. You know, we find the single celled organisms living in the liquid on uh, the moons of Jupiter. Like this is a one process. Hopes. One hopes. <laughs> right, right. But we we have found evidence, you know, everywhere we've looked that it's it appears that life is trying. And we are the only things we've discovered that actually might have the ability to allow that process to succeed. And that is a fucking, that's not a scientific mission. That, in my opinion, now is a sacred mission. It's a, it's a scientific sacred mission, in my opinion, at this point. Okay, so I have no choice but to be the devil's advocate in this conversation, right? Please. We know that at least the way that we think about, you know, I, I usually find myself speaking out against this position, but it's robust and well argued and it deserves uh, some error, which is that all of life is the process, like all of this order that we're seeing, all of this emergent uh, novelty and, and creativity and diversity is the product of a metabolic process that is really just energy seeking rest you know that that all of the biosphere is a sort of physics response that 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 biology is is understood as you know just the most efficient way for energy to dissipate in a system so like all of the things that we have are are the consequence of available energy being stepped down into a lower energy state by these living systems. And so the living systems are, in some sense, you know, just accelerating the pace at which the universe, as we understand it, is just falling apart. And that local order is bought at the price of global disorder. You know, that if you look at, uh, you know, we abs the planet absorbs sunlight, but then it emits waste heat you know, and like we, the more we develop these new complex forms, the faster this, you know, the more we waste, you know, the more energy, like the amount of electricity required to power civilization now is just absurd. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I saw this great thing, uh, this hilarious meme today that was like 1973, we've got four kilobytes of Ram. We're sending people to the moon 2019. We've got 16 gigabytes of Ram. And uh, it's because Excel has an open dialogue script somewhere. It's like running, you know, 100% on our computer. Like we've just, the more we have, the more sort of we can be wasteful about it or the more, you know, so it just seems as though there's a, there's a non-duality here that like saying yes is also saying yes to death and decay and yes, uh, chaos yes, yes, and yes, all of that. So yes. what do you, where's your, where do you stand on that? Absolutely, man. Absolutely. And actually, toward the end of, of that trip, I started to confront that. I started to dip deeper into, you know, the negative connotations that come along with life, all of the inevitable problems of evil and impermanence and, you know, dukkha and suffering that you also get with life. But I think if you zoom out on that process collectively, and you just look at an ecosystem. It's the difference between saying, I want this thing to exist with all of its ups and downs, or it would be better off not existing because there are, are downs that come with the ups. You know, it's it's like saying yes to romance versus no to romance. You know, it's the, the cheesy phrase of it's better to have loved and lost than never loved at all. Right. And I think that I believe that about life. I believe that even with the inherent darkness and suffering that comes along with it, that it's worth it. And if you don't believe that, you may as well, you know, go back to the the thought experiment of Camus that he presents at the beginning of the myth of Sisyphus, that the only real philosophical question worth asking is, should we all kill ourselves? <laughs> you know, and, and if, and that, sure. I mean, that that's worth considering. It's worth asking yourself if it's, if it's worth being alive, but I do think it's worth being alive. And I, and I also think that there's another follow-up uh, challenge that that could be asked here and it's 
look at what we've done so far. You know, we we've got a lot of problems. Like we're like I said, we are we are rapidly racing toward this kind of like sacred scientific mission, but we're just as rapidly racing toward self-destruction and uh, both on a personal level and a societal level. I mean, look at the suicide rates right now. They're off the charts. It's it's terrifying stuff. Look at the, you know, all of the projections of how much longer uh, Earth can handle the sort of abuse we're putting it under. It's a pretty scary scenario that we're being confronted with on both the microcosm and the macrocosm. But I think this is where Manly P. Hall's point about correction comes in. And that if we're all on this same page, if we can all agree upon what the larging, overarching game is, so to speak, then I think if we're all in that common spirit, we can start to at least have some underlying agreed upon goals. And if we're looking at our lives as a way to participate in this larger, noble, overarching game, I think that's the beginning of a massive correction. But it's we're so far from that, man. We're so, so far from that. Mm, well, again, you know, just to uh, play the balance point here, doesn't, I mean, it's like we're just going back in a, a, kind of a little bit of a circle here, but doesn't doesn't an embrace of life and all of its ecosystemic diversity sort of preclude everyone getting on the same page here? Like, I mean, isn't that sort of the, the basis for evil in, in theology is, is choice. And that, uh, you know, there, there's the, the argument that, you know, a, a God capable of limiting itself is greater than a God that is incapable of limiting itself, which shows up again in like, in these notions about uh, like group evolution and how, you know, to, to make a, to give a mundane example, it's like the, the issue of neurodiversity in the workplace and how it makes sense to have people that see the world in radically different ways because it improves the collective intelligence of the group because every perspective is just a model of reality. And every model has some sort of uh, error and it's, it's in the variance between these models that we get a sort of like a stereoscopic image of, of what is. And so there it's like, doesn't this story require the opponent? Doesn't it require people who just do not give a fuck and are willing to like burn the whole thing down? I think it may require it as a, a counterbalance or a motivation I mean, really, it's almost like we're we're trying to, you know, if there is a mind of God, it's like we're trying to do the thing the Bible says we can't do in that you can, you know, you can essentially the reasoning of God is beyond the the faculties of mortals. So so don't worry about it. I think that's like a book of Job thing after he, you know, after he abuses Job or whatever, um, just to prove just to see how um how good of a of a little boy he is and how how well he'll uh continue to adhere to believing in in God but yeah i mean i that's a that's a huge question i i don't know if that diversity is required but i will say that i think until we can agree upon this overarching idea because this is this is what natural law is, quote unquote, is all predicated upon, right? That there are these sort of greater natural rules. And Manly P. Hall talks about this, too, in this lecture, that we're out of sync with larger overarching natural rules. And as long as we're out of sync with these rules, problems are going to keep emerging. Disease of all sorts, you know, literal and figurative are going to continue to emerge. And it sounds a little simplistic and a little bit idealistic that, oh, we could live in this some sort of um, harmony with the geometry of of nature and we'll have no problems. But I think there is a lot of utility in that utopian type thinking, even if it is unachievable. You know, this is one of Plato's favorite thought experiments to do is to meditate upon the ideal of a thing. 
you know, meditate upon the ideal school, meditate upon the ideal society. And even if you cannot achieve that ideal in doing so, you are finding holes in the current system and you can start to plug those holes. So, I mean, I I understand this is a super idealistic (laughs) thing. You know, I understand that this is just super, super unlikely to ever be achieved, especially in our own you know, the way we exist right now. I mean, maybe we're going to need some sort of crazy hive mind technology to all come to some sort of uh, meta consensus or something before anything like this can even ever start to unfold earnestly. But I do think that it's what life wants, to put it in a very, very problematic terminology. (laughs) So I want to hear about how you... like. This is all very interesting, um, but I think a a routine problem I get into on this show is letting things drift off into the abstract. And I think it's important Mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. anchor them in the story of like how you actually came to this. Like, what was it like for you to experience this as a psychedelic revelation? I want to hear that. I want to hear your trip report. Um, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know, the feeling of I don't know if you get where the existential dread typically socks you like in what, in what part of the trip. Uh, but for me, it was definitely in the, in the come on. And it, it was sort of just a stark reminder of you're a shivering little being in the shadow of infinity, you know, that, that kind of feeling. And then really getting down into that, what that, feels like and you know imagining yourself as this like shivering organism in the in the forest and just being at the mercy of all of these forces so much greater than you and then from there really zooming in on how wonderful it is to have loved ones how wonderful it is to have fellowship how wonderful it is to be shielded by society and all of these things that we're constantly taking for granted and then the realization that hey You've been elevated to this point through countless generations of toil and trial and error and circumstances far beyond your understanding have allowed you to evolve to this point. So now what? And the now what for me was you got to continue this process. You got to try to make this continue happening to its logical conclusion. And what does that look like? You know, and, and it looks like what we've been discussing, but it also looks like, you know, yeah, there there are these vast swaths of the earth that are kind of barren of everything we're talking about still, right? But think about as soon as you get off the earth, it's 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 truly barren. It's truly, truly barren. It's truly like one tiny blue marble organism. In an in just infinite, infinite nothingness. And that little that little spot wants to sprout leaves. That little spot wants to, you know, do what every organism wants to do and reach out fractally, tendrally, and connect to the next node and light that node up with life and continue that process. So that's that's what it looked like and felt like from what I can recall. Mm. So here's a question for you. This is, this is, a, this is something that at the, the Santa Fe Institute, and I, I'm, I'm so glad that you can just let me continue to be the contrarian here. Um, yeah, of course. At, 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 Cause it's been, I don't even fuck. It's been like years since I tripped, frankly, which I really, yeah. To wow. your, to your point about, uh, well, Okay. No, I take that back, but it's been a while Um, (laughs) to your point about, uh, you know, being a a very vocal proponent and, you know, people probably thinking that you trip all the time. It's like, well, it's just the fact is that this is where the most interesting shit is happening. You know, it's, 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 you can have one of experience like this that can propel you into contemplation and exegesis for the rest of your life. So it's not like, at any rate, um, I had this thought, I guess it was around, it was 2010. I had a trip where I realized that the void was already full and that, you know, it was almost like a, like a Tibetan Buddhist sort of mandala where I realized that what we think of as silence is 
just so full of intelligence and life and mm. information that it's beyond our ability to cognize, to compute. Yeah. Um, although I, you know, I hesitate to bring in the computational metaphor when we're talking about biology, but at any rate, it's too late. It's in there. But this thought that, that the room is already full, right? So there's that. Um, and you know, the notion, this is a two-parter, right? That one is this notion that the world is already alive and already intelligent. And so are we like bullshitting ourselves by thinking that we're bringing about some sort of apotheosis, you know, in the same way that the, the Europeans thought that they were achieving something with manifest destiny, you know, that they were, that they, they saw this, you know, this fantastic, like blank canvas of America that was already populated, you know, and, 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 and cultured. And, and so I worry about that a little bit with, you know, with us imagining that, you know, we're adding anything to the universe. So there's one concern. And then the other concern is there's this thing at, at the Santa Fe Institute. Um, they talk about the L Farrell bar problem, which is um, this cool bar in Santa Fe where the, the physicists would go and, and hang out and drink beers after work. And the L Farrell bar problem is a game theoretic issue, which is basically like, at what point does it become unworth it to go to the bar because it's too crowded. Like at what point does a particular idea become too popular and, or, you know, or, or a place, a party becomes too crowded or, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. or like, you know, another concrete example would be the rests in music, you know, like the form requires formlessness in order to, have a form right in order to take shape so i don't know how these two different sort of ontologies actually stand with each other but both of them strike me as meaningful critiques of this idea that that we're contributing to some sort of evolutionary engulfment of the unused potential of our universe you know it's like maybe it's already that way and we're just rearranging stuff in you know mm -hmm. to suit our own sort of image or idea and the other is that maybe maybe a certain amount of chaos or emptiness or or suffering is required uh that there's like a minimal reservoir required for life and mind and all the good shit to even have any meaning so i don't know where do you stand on those thank you yeah <laughs> Man, I feel like in in that series of questions, w we would have to solve like every branch of philosophy to to answer. We got metaphysics, we got we got like aesthetics. When you were talking about the sort of uh, ideal form of things, like there are so many directions to go on that. But uh, just to start riffing, I absolutely think that it's entirely possible that we are just one very finite flavor of life and that like you said there may already be information rippling through the cosmos in a way that we're mostly invisible to that we're just beginning to see the sort of signatures of through a combination of scientific and reflective sorts of uh knowledge acquisition like whatever that thing is, the you know the binary fractal self replicating algorithm at the root of reality, or logos, or uh, you know the sort of all spanning consciousness sort of god that a lot of philosophers have waxed about, like uh, you know Spinoza's god, or there was just another in uh, Manly P. Hall's book today. I was actually reading. Um, he he does this insane feat where he sort of smashes all of the history of philosophy into like 40 pages at the beginning of the book. But the, pro <laughs> the problem is, is it'll be like you'll move from one thinker to the next in the span of like a page or even a paragraph. So sometimes they all kind of run together. But yeah, man, I do. I do think it's possible that there's some element of information and life already latent in the universe, but I still, and, and, and I also believe that it's highly likely that we're somehow an emanation of that or attached to that or a lesser form of that, uh, maybe mm. a somewhat perverted form of that. You know, again, this kind of gets back to the platonic thinking or the, the idea that there's a 
collective unconscious that were sort of physical projections of somehow. But I still see the same reality where there is this, you know, forever unfolding to use, uh, I think that was Manly P. Hall's phrase or the forever becoming that is occurring. And once that process is kicked off, it doesn't stop. So it's it's sort of like a, a Pandora's box that as soon as you, you know, hit the necessary chemical, psycho-spiritual chemical components required to kick that process off, there's no stopping it. So it's it's to me, it does seem like it still seems like that dichotomy of either you're on board with that process of unfolding or you're not. And I think as you know, because whether we're a perverted a uh, very limited version of that pre-existing information or not. I mean, even if we are, like let's let's express it to to its fullest. Like let's see how high it goes. Let's see if eventually it merges with that overarching information structure. I feel like that's our our only option. So where do you stand on um Moore's law? And, and the, like what, you know, this, a lot of this stuff sounds to me like what, uh, you know, Kevin Kelly, when you talk about what the universe wants or what life wants, Kevin Kelly's book, what technology wants, where he, he suggests that all of technology is, is just a, an expression of the same phenomenon Mm -hmm. that drives the, you know, the emergence of, of order in living systems and, and that it's a thermodynamic process and that it's constantly accelerating. And that it's getting it's getting faster and faster and smaller and smaller, you know, and processing more and more information. And that we're we're just sort of um, humankind is just sort of on this relay race, handing off the baton to the you know silicon life forms or whatever comes next. Um, so, how, how do you stand on um, the notion that like? transhumanist or singularitarian concerns are part of this. Cause I mean, there's, I mean, yeah. I know that you and yeah. I have both given a lot of thought to this and critiqued some of that stuff kind of heavily. And I think it's important to not confuse the kind of, uh, technodelia that you are so fond of with this sort of headlong, reckless rush into the, the blender that's just eating the biosphere, right? Like, so uh, yeah, I don't yeah. know. Where do you? <laughs> how do you walk that tightrope? Well, I'm I'm definitely not a materialist, so I don't think that this sort of concern that has become the the progeny of of technological innovation, this concern of now we can become immortal by continuing to do this process that you were talking about, you know, making everything more information dense and faster at a smaller and smaller point. I do think that that is, that is necessary for what I'm talking about, but I also think it's a massive mistake to think that that's our spiritual salvation. I don't believe that at all. I I'm, if anything, I guess it's kind of ironic because even though I'm talking about these things that would inherently require massive technological innovation. I'm not really that interested in the empirical uh, nitty gritty of science. Like I'm glad there are some people that are, but I'm not that person. I want to know why I'm, I'm the type of person who is obsessed with why and using why as an exploratory tool to define myself and define what I think all of this shit is about. And, I'm much more interested in in the the rational side of it and I think that's what's missing. I think the process of material innovation is well on its way and it's not going to stop. There are so many carrots attracting that forward at this point. I I think what we need now is the other side of it. We need the contextualization. We need to focus more on the what it all means. And, I th- and, and I'm hoping that what we're talking about excites people, you know, and, and I'm hoping it makes them feel like more of a part of some unbelievably large overarching thing and not these little acute worlds of, you know, 
curation and nonsense and vapidity because I think that's the that's the the pitfall you know is is as we progress it becomes easier and easier to eat the low hanging fruit instead of the you know going on the journey to the nutrition so I don't even know if that answered your question but well I mean um, so here's a concrete example for you um, in in terms of participating in you know the biogenesis or the quickening. I like, I'm quite fond of that word, you know, the quickening because it, it suggests, you know, rather than like the singularity, right. It's, it's a, a, a phase transition in which the, the non-living becomes the living, you know, which, which might just be uh, epistemic, right. It might just mean us seeing life and mind in places that we didn't recognize it before. Um, but it also speaks to this acceleration of the pace of life as experienced by human beings. Um, in this quickening, do you regard, say, you know, like virtual influencers? And actually, you know, this to tie this back to our Westworld conversation in episode fourteen. Like, do you do you regard, like, you know, the possibility of the sentient machine as uh, part of this process? Um, and, and, and if you do, how does that, how do you differentiate like in, in that kind of setting in that framing, how do you differentiate this sort of growth towards, it almost sounds to me like you're talking about like the Greek concept of arete or like personal excellence. Mm. How do you differentiate that with sort of this blind rush into the, uh, the spectacle and the consumer products or byproducts of, of this phenomenon? Yeah, it's going to for sure take an, a, a larger philosophical epiphany to make all of this harmonize. You know, I, I mean, clearly keeping the dominant backdrop being that of a capitalistic one is probably not going to work on its own because capitalism has usurped everything. Capitalism has usurped religion it's usurped it's usurped philosophy i mean these are all highly highly secondary concerns to you know how we make our living now i i was just um i can't recall if i was talking about this on a podcast but i was just talking to someone about how both joseph campbell and oh, who was it that was talking about this both joseph campbell and someone else were talking about how the religions we have today are essentially these like monkey religions. It's almost like they're a, they're a little feather in the cap of a larger outfit because we'll go to church, you know, if we do even go to church, which most of us don't, we'll go to church one day a week and then work five days a week. So you tell me in that scenario what the person's really worshiping. Are they worshiping God or are they worshiping the company and worshiping, you know, the kind of idol of the dollar? And to me, it's clearly they're worshiping the idol of the dollar. But that is not soul filling in any way, shape or form. That is not something that imbues us as individuals or as a society with larger purpose. And I do think that that is one of these vital corrections that is just throbbing to be addressed in, in you know, both what Manly P. Hall was talking about and what, um, what uh, Joseph Campbell talks about in a lot of his writings and musings as well. And as long as we don't make that correction, I think the problems are going to continue. So I think to address one part of your question, it is going to require some sort of philosophical or societal epiphany where I don't think we're going to get rid of capitalism because I actually think it's a really good system to uh, reward merit and continue evolution on a technological basis. But I think we need something else to fill us with purpose and we need to be we need to be practicing capitalism in the light of a larger good or the light of a larger mission or ideal that we're completely missing on any kind of cohesive level right now. And I can't even remember all the other parts of your question. So well, I'll leave it at that. All right. Well, like, um, how about, you know, when we were talking about this over text message, uh, I brought up 
Accelerando, or I didn't bring it up specifically, but it's a Accelerando, mm-hmm. the novel mm-hmm. by Charles Strauss is a great example of this, of this kind of runaway process where it's, you know, life as we understand it, bringing more of itself to the cosmos. Mm-hmm. And the way that that manifests is in our computers basically optimizing the physical reality for computation so that it it can, you know, simulate uh, more efficiently than our biology, which is, by the way, currently impossible. Uh, Just to like have a, you know, a a cold shower on, on any singulatarians who might be listening, um, five orders of magnitude more thermodynamically efficient uh, cells, living cells are in terms of computing, um, mm-hmm. like to the degree that we think of cells as computers, they're like 10,000 times better at computing, you know, than the fastest computing of any kind that we have. And we don't know even, even quantum. Yeah. Well, like, well, we just don't, I mean, quantum computing currently is still kind of in, in like, you know, hype slash joke, oh, yeah. joke phase, but like, we really don't understand how, living systems are doing it so much more effectively and it probably is some sort of quantum thing, but you know, so it seems a long way off from this scenario, but at any rate in Accelerando, the, the, uh, the offspring of humankind end up just devouring all of the planets in our solar system to turn them into computronium, which is, which is this hypothetical, uh, matter optimized for computing, you know? And so, uh, there's, you know, a lot of science fiction addresses this. There's, um, usually some sort of issue where like our, our fear of being devoured by this process, uh, we find out once we are devoured that we sort of live forever in the transcendent unity of the singular, you know, post-human consciousness or whatever, um, Mm -hmm. that it's, it's, it's a sort of, manifest heaven or I don't know. But like the, the point is that it's like, um, wh- how does it sit for you in resonance or in dissonance with your, your thinking on this, that kind of a scenario that, that we have to sort of relinquish the slow cold sphere of human concerns to the small, fast molten sphere of, of post biological mm-hmm life and intelligence because yeah i mean it's very much like the you know the the angels being like oh god what are what are these people you know or the titan the, the war between the titans and the gods you know like this sort of theme of like getting replaced by the doll that has come to life shows up again and again yeah. and again yeah and i mean it's it's funny because that wouldn't be the first time in our history right we create something that winds up taking us over i mean look at ca- again capitalism we made it up it's a thing we made up and it's essentially running all of our lives now. We're, we're so hyper-focused in the daily of that, that it has basically, it's become our whole reason for existing if, if we don't choose a larger one. And, or I, I should say, if we don't recognize a larger one, because I don't think it's all about just, you know, again, to go back to Camus, I don't think it's just about you know, going through the existentialist thought experiment and arriving at anything is a valid choice. I think that's bullshit too. I think that there is a real overarching choice to be made here. And it's not just some, you know, postmodern, like everything's equal type of cop out. I, I don't believe that. And I do think what you're describing is a real danger that will probably emerge as our technology gets more and more powerful and starts to offer us more and more temptations at every step, there's going to be an opportunity to to slip off the slope and probably do even greater damage than we could do right now. And I think it gets back again to, uh, to put it in the, in the words of, of Hall, you know, he, he says that we're the carpenters, you know, we're the ones who are architecting this process and, architecture is hard work, man. Building the cathedrals was very, very hard work. Mm. It took, you know, artisans of every discipline, multiple lifetimes to finish a cathedral. And it wasn't easy work. And I, I, I wonder how many people died in the process, like due to accidents or due to God knows what. And I think it's going to be that, but, you know, orders of magnitude 
crazier to ever come close to accomplishing any of these ideas that we're talking about. But I, I, I think it's, I think it's the only thing that excites me enough to think that it's worth doing. Like this notion that we're just like little bubbles on the wave of evolution that is headed somewhere. And at some point, our portion of the wave will go on back into the water, but the next crest and the next crest and the next crest will keep coming and keep building and keep contributing to this larger oceanic movement is just, it's, it's very exciting to me in, in a way that almost nothing else has been. So how does this manifest for you personally then? Like how is this changing yeah, the way that yeah. you live? It's, it's forced me to ask the question, you know, a lot of the classic philosophical questions about how to live the best possible life have taken on a new kind of sheen to me because I not I consider those questions in the light of this larger scenario that we're talking about. And I think when you have that almost kind of, you know, in, in a way it's 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 like redefining the almighty in a way it's like having something new to worship and aspire toward and when you have that it can be difficult to see well what does that mean on a daily basis and if sure if if you're just looking at the light in the far off distance yeah it, it is but when you start to hierarchically carve your life up into things that orient toward that it makes all the sense in the world and that's something that i've actually been writing a lot about is how do a lot of these larger, you know, highfalutin philosophical ideas actually become practices in your own life? And I think the answer is, is that it's a, it's a hierarchical thing that emanates from, you know, your, your daily mundane practices, which emanate into your projects that you want to give energy to, which then are feeding your larger ethos and your ethos is informed by this larger, you know, the transcendent almost idea that we've been talking about. So I think if it encourages people, you know, this or, or any other idea worth aspiring to encourages people to explore that hierarchical system all the way from the transcendent down into the mundane, I think that's what we need to do. I think that's the answer, because how many people, man, like really sit down and do these exercises where they they think about here's the ideal, here's the transcendent, here's how it flows down into my daily practices. It's like, who's actually doing these things? Not very many people. But I think that that's the sort of uh, that's the sort of ritual you need to go through to solidify what it is you're doing here. And if if this idea or or not even maybe this idea but someone else's version of this idea inspires them to do that i think it's worth it i think that's part of this correction process that we all need to go through personally and on on a meta level okay so do you regard then this as a process that the entire universe is is tilted toward and if so is it possible that we just no matter what we do that we're contributing to this great work. Like it's one of those, it's like, you know, like the issue of prophecy and fate, right? Like mm -hmm. if it's going to happen, then anything you're going to do, whether it's for or against it conceptually is going to bring you there, right? Like you're going to fulfill the prophecy. So yeah. do you get to just fuck off or like, is, I, is your, I think is, is like, is being a couch potato part of, you know, the imminentizing the eschaton here or what? Oh yeah, man. I mean, it absolutely is of the most vital importance that you don't fuck off, but for both you and for this larger process, because I don't think that it's inevitable that this will occur. I think that it could not occur. I mean, clearly, like I said, it's a race between annihilation and utopia kind of. And I think this this is where it gets extremely personal and extremely practical, because if you I think that there is this uh, this. So there's this notion that the Greeks used to debate about called eudaimonia. And it's really cool because the etymology of it is the word for good and then the word diamond, 
like that eventually became demon. So it means good spirit. And they would debate about how do you develop this good spirit in your own life? And my favorite answers came from both Plato and Aristotle in different ways. Of course, Plato's contention was that it was by ordering the so for Plato, the the mind and the soul were the same thing. Like a like a clear mind was the soul, a mind that was uncorrupted and cleansed of kind of sensory pollution and emotions. The most basic unified state of your mind was your soul. And for him, if you could order your mind, you were living in this state of eudaimonia or eudaimonia, however you say it. And for Aristotle, though, and this is where it gets really practical, it was living a life of virtue. And what virtue to him was, was learning to, in every situation, arrive at a golden mean. So kind of, you know, realizing what is the best possible good that I could do with my own set of circumstances in this situation. And what I love about this is it's not like it's not like a band-aid for what would be the best for you to do is not the same thing as what would be the best for me to do. So it's it's all absolutely incumbent upon the individual because for him I mean it's like a life of overcoming. It's a life of things never being done, but always in progress. It's a life of achieving your individual respective maximum that no one else can achieve, which then also implies a, 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 rather implies a lot of failing, failing and trying again on the way. So it's it's one of these things that fits in. It's like the microcosm unfolding to its maximum potential to contribute to the maximum doing the same thing. So it's not like, oh, no matter what, it's just going to happen. It's it's no, if you don't go through this process, you know, that Aristotle and the Greeks called eudaimonia, Manly P. Hall calls correction, whatever. If you don't go through this process, the macro will not go through this process either. So if I don't go to the gym, no one gets raptured. Great, man. Yeah. As ridiculous as it sounds, I think it's true because it's, I think as long as we're personally on an individual level living in some sort of delusion or not expressing ourselves to the maximum, I th- I mean, think about it. The nodes surrounding you directly suffer. You know, your family directly suffers when you don't do the maximum good that you could do. And then there's a ripple effect that occurs, right? Yeah. But I mean, again, like... It is such a personal calculation. Um, you know, I wonder, you know, to the extent that we are talking about universal issues here, like, do you think that we are, um, you know, like, uh, this is such a shitty example, but, you know, let's, let's say, you know, your limited ethnocentric perspective is that the best thing that you can do is be efficient in the genocide of some other people, right? Are you, uh, like, is it, are you working towards the universal integration and, and the fulfillment of potential by being a better Nazi? Really? You know, like, and, and then again, like so many people are locked up in, in this like, uh, capitalist delusion, like is, is hastening the paperclip machine devouring our biosphere, really and this is why I, you know, I brought up all that stuff about accelerando and and the singularity and so on it's like because because it's like we have this idea of what it means to bring something ab- about to bring about a destiny but we're all so limited and our understanding like how can that possibly be the thing and then like maybe it is better for some some of us to just fucking sit out on this calculation i don't know like yeah i mean I don't know. I mean, that's not for, that's not for me to say, of course, but I and and perhaps it is just ridiculously idealistic, but it's the only thing that makes sense for me on a personal level to try my hardest to define what the 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 maximum good or virtue that I can achieve is and then go after that. I mean, there's there's really nothing else that I can do. And what I like about this scenario is it's not even though it is predicated upon the individual maxing out their capabilities or or doing their best is it's not like 
because you fucked up a little bit, everything is just, you know, forever and irrevocably fucked. I mean, this is eventually, you know, all of this gets into such uh, prognosticatory territory and metaphysics and ontology and blah, 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 that we can never possibly uh, define. But I think you're, you're right to bring it down to a practical level and ask, you know, how the, how the rubber meets the road here. And for me, that that's how the rubber meets the road. And of, of course, no, I don't think it should be being the best Nazi you can be or making the most paper clips the most efficiently that you can. I mean, I think if anything, people in those positions, uh, for, for them, the maximum virtue probably would have been to contradict whatever their circumstances are. And yeah, that's, that's tough to do when you're, when you're living in a certain context, I suppose. But that's like asking, that's like asking us to not podcast or something. Oh no, man. I think, I think podcasting is definitely part of me maxing out, you know, like living virtuously. I think that, I think that if anything, it's like one of the few things that I do that I feel like has any kind of really positive ripple. Wouldn't you agree? I mean, yeah, I'm, most of what I do does not have any positive ripple. <laughs> it's no 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 i totally i totally do agree um i think well i mean in in so far as you know again to to view this from a, a woefully insufficient sort of metaphor of, of uh collective computation again i think that there's something you know we're all going to get it wrong i think is where i stand on this mm-hmm, 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 you know mm-hmm. it's not just the nazi uh that's going to get it wrong or the you know the irs clerk or whatever it's the the um apologies to irs clerks in the audience um i am no one but the the uh the fact that all of us are limited and and mistaken and therefore there's a there's sort of a symphonic level at which like it's like we're all tugging a parachute uh tight to make a trampoline you know and like the real expansion is in every direction it's not in one direction you know, so all of us err slightly from the bullseye of what it means to, to, mm-hmm. to really grab at this thing at an individual level, but then collectively we're all contributing to something, you know, in a, in a meaningful way. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. And, and hopefully we're getting, you know, even though we're never hitting the bullseye in the direct center, hopefully we're getting a little closer and a little closer. And remember a lot of the Greeks Pythagoras, Plato, many others believed in metempsychosis. They believed in a sort of transmigration. So maybe, maybe it's a, maybe it's a multi-lifetime process. I don't know. Uh, well, shit, dude. Okay. So, um, <laughs> you know, I love to wrap these by asking, and we've, we've kind of been doing this, uh, through the whole show, but, you know, taking this sort of block universe perspective that all moments are in some sense simultaneous and that the future is present in this conversation, that that the that the unborn generations are listening and possibly even influencing this discussion. How does that change the way that you live specifically? Or like what would you what would you hope comes out of a deepening interchange between present and and future perspectives as regards this sort of, you know, this sort of evolutionary curve and our participation in the great carpentry of things. Um, can you hold on? Can you rephrase the question? Yeah. Well, sure I would I... say just like, okay, so we've been having this whole conversation, assuming that we're, we're participating in a process that we're groping towards mm-hmm, something mm-hmm. What if we just took for granted that, as Terrence McKenna did, that that something is really like in the room right now and is like paying attention to us and to our lives? I've definitely had this experience. I remember a uh, a trip in 2012 where I feel like I felt like I was communicating to my own biological descendants as they were participating in the noosphere that had enfolded all of biology and technology around the planet. And that it was like speaking to my own future generations as they were 
the sort of local manifestations of a planet, what we would think of as like a planet level God mind, you know, and they were asking for me, this is a very common DMT report that you get that there's like the future is asking for you to contribute to its own, to its manifestation, you know, to that, Mm -hmm, that it's like, mm -hmm. it's saying, Hey, I need you to really fits in. Yeah. I need you to like pull down this particular corner of the circus tent or the whole thing's going to fly away. You know, so like, I don't know, what's, what is that like for you and your experience and, and what, what do you, you know, what difference does it make in your life that between seeing the future as something yet to be created and seeing the future as something which already is and in which you are playing a part, I guess. I mean, for me, it makes all the difference because it's the difference between having a burden just randomly thrust upon you and choosing one or choosing a, you know, again, it gets back to the the kind of famous existentialist point that Sartre and Camus and all these other people essentially argued for is that we're, we're all just hanging out in a bunch of absurdity. There's no reason for these cosmic circumstances. Just choose whatever the fuck you want. And for me, that is unbelievably unsatisfying. And I think it is a although a very solid logical argument and one that you can't empirically ever disprove it, it there's something from the core of me that screams that that's absolutely wrong and that there is a larger reality and that there is a larger point to our individual lives and in the macro. And I think without that perspective, I would truly feel lost. I would truly feel like this is all fucking pointless and we may as well just live the most, you know, epicurean indulgent lives possible because you know uh, it's just a uh, like a pointless meat suit party for a few years until you get sick and wither and die in the shadow of a nihilistic uncaring universe so just do whatever <laughs> the fuck you want and and i can't i'm not i can't accept that you know and maybe that's maybe that's just some uh neuroses that i have but be that as it may that's where the importance of this really lands is that there is an overarching point there is it does matter what you choose you do have a modicum of free will and that not only do you that is the point of of this incarnation is to exercise those faculties and and we're i think that we're given a certain bandwidth to operate within for a very specific reason you know that you know the the whole conversation of do we or don't we have free will because we're under the constant influence of of so many forces of physics and biology and genetics and whatever i mean clearly there's a a floor and a ceiling to to what we can choose between and it's it's a very finite bandwidth but i think everything that matters is in that bandwidth. I don't see that as a restriction to indicate that there's no point to anything. I see that as the lane that we can operate within. And within that lane, in my opinion, lies all of the, all of the meaning. Mm. Dude, that's a fine place to wrap it. A fine way to say it. I do want to, just as a, as a slight PS in defense of Mm. Epicureanism, I learned recently that Contrary to popular sort of understanding that the, yeah, the Epicureans yeah. were committed to the cultivation of lasting good, you know, that they, mm-hmm. they were looking for things yep. that were not just sort of like ephemeral pleasure, but a deepening of the soul, even if they didn't really sort of believe in, in a, uh, the transmigration of the soul. So I think this conversation is, is evident of, of a, uh, a true Epicurean good in that regard. And uh, I'm really glad that we gave some time to this discussion on the show. Um, obviously, people can find you at Third Eye Drops podcast. Uh, where else would you send people? Where Where do you your writing on Medium uh, is under your? I forget it's under your name or? Uh, yeah, I believe it's under Michael Phillip. You can find it at thirdeyedrops.com. Regardless, that's that's kind of a good overarching place to go. And if you you want to listen to the pod can find third eye drops everywhere that podcasts are distributed awesome dude thanks for being on the show of course man it's my pleasure thanks again for listening future fossils is one of many illuminating podcasts available on the mind pod network i recommend you uh, trip on over there and check them all out 
for more episodes, show notes, and extensive copious extras, and head over to patreon.com slash Michael Garfield. Subscribe to the show anywhere you go for podcasts. And I'm always happy to hear from you. Future Fossils Podcast at gmail.com. Thanks for listening. And may your now be deep, wide, and wonderful. Until next time.